Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 47. Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. Hear now the word of our Lord. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the living and active word of our Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time, and we ask, Lord, now that you would take your word and apply it to us, your people, not only by the power of your spirit, but, Lord, in such a way that we are empowered to perceive and to see by faith our Savior, Jesus Christ. Conform us, not only individually, but conform us as a church into his image, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if the book of Acts ended right here? (laughs) The church, now filled with the Spirit, day by day gathering together to hear the word preached, day by day more and more coming to saving faith and added to the church. And yet, we have many more chapters to go. This is not... The end point, as it were, this is just a filling station. This is a a mountaintop retreat before, and you'll see soon enough, we get back into the trenches of a fallen world and the church is embattled. Peter has just preached a powerful Christ-centered and spirit-filled sermon, not only calling his hearers to repentance, but commanding them to devote themselves as followers of and believers in Jesus Christ. And the result of that sermon that we saw last week, the result, I remind you, that could only have come about by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, was that 3,000 people were born again. Believed in Jesus. They were baptized as followers of Jesus. The preaching of the Word of God leads to the building up of the people of God. And what we'll see this morning is something of the vital signs, the signs of life in a spirit-filled church. Now we need to be clear here, and I've brought this up already, and we'll return to this warning time and time again. Not everything in the books of Acts is prescriptive. That is, just because we read about the New Testament church doing this or that thing, that doesn't mean that God intends for His church always to be doing this or that thing. Some things in the book of Acts are descriptive. That is, Acts is merely describing an event or practice. And then some other things are prescriptive. That is, we really are seeing a model on how the church and how Christians should always act. The warning I want to give is that it's difficult when reading and interpreting the book of Acts to always discern between is this descriptive or prescriptive. One of the tools we have to help us is to see if later in the New Testament, the epistles and the writings command the church to keep doing a certain practice or not. So for instance, in John 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet and then he says, quote, If I, then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I I have done to you. Is that a prescriptive 
command that all churches and all Christians should practice? Why don't churches wash the feet of others? One part of the answer is, well, we don't walk on dirt roads with sandals anymore, and so we don't need to. There's a practicality here. The principle, perhaps, is still there. Show hospitality, but the accidents are not there. But another part of that answer is that we don't see the practice picked up later in the New Testament, either in the book of Acts, nor as a command in the New Testament letters to the churches on what they are supposed to be doing as a church. Therefore, it's quite right to conclude that this practice of Jesus is more descriptive than prescriptive. We'll need to be doing the same kind of things throughout the book, book of Acts, and we'll see in this passage this morning the same kind of thing awry. Now, still, what we will see this morning are generally speaking the marks of a spirit-filled church. Think about the context. Who did Peter just preach to? He was preaching to Jews. Yes, they were foreign nationals. These were Jews who lived elsewhere. Jews who had their homes in Cappadocia. Jews who had their homes in Egypt or Arabia. But they were all back in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. They hear the disciples, now empowered by the Spirit, miraculously speaking to them in their own language, and they say, what is this going on? Peter preaches to them and explains to them, this is the work of the Spirit being poured out. Well, why is the Spirit of God being poured out? Well, because the Messiah has come. Yep, you killed him, but he didn't stay dead. Jesus rose from the dead. He's ascended back to the Father, and as such, as a vindication of his successful ministry, Namely, dying is an atoning sacrifice for you. He has now poured out his spirit on all who believe in him. Peter ends his sermon with, repent. Repent, therefore, believe in him, and be baptized in his name. And what do they do? Well, they believe. And there are now 3,000 brand new Christians who, get this, don't live in Jerusalem, but now want to stay in Jerusalem. Why? Because they want to continue learning from the disciples on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now that context is somewhat important here when we get to that line about them selling and giving up everything to help everyone there in the new church. What we get here then are the activities, the spirit-filled, the spirit-guided activities of this essentially early church. Here's the first church, as it were. Now, the first mark. The first vital sign of this spirit-filled church is that they are a word-centered church. They are a word-centered church. Look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This focus of the early church stands, I believe, as the primary mark of the spirit-filled church. It's listed here first because it's primary. It's out of this that everything else, I think, flows. In fact, all of verse 42 seems to flow out of and cascade from this first primary marker. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So what's going on here? Well, first, notice that whatever it is that they're doing, they are doing it devotedly. Can you see that? They devoted themselves. There's a fixed focus. There's a commitment that continues, a, a pattern that persists. And what were they devoted to? Luke tells us they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the doctrine of the apostles. Isn't it striking that the first thing this band of new Christians give themselves to is learning? It's not inner mystical experiences, but word-centered, theologically rich teaching. And we know what the apostles taught. It was exactly what Jesus had taught them. And now, what the Holy Spirit is bringing back to their recollection, as well as what the Spirit is illuminating to them as they reread and unpack the Old Testament in all its now Christ Christ-centered, Christotelic light. Just as Peter preached and taught from the Old Testament in his first sermon, applying the gospel out of these Old Testament texts to his modern day hearers, so he would have continued to teach God's word to them. Josh read for us earlier from John 
15, where Jesus promises that he will send his spirit to the apostles for the task of teaching. Authoritative teaching that comes from Jesus through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and then outward to those people they're teaching. Quote, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. That's a very important promise in the history of God's redemptive purposes. It's Jesus saying that what the apostles teach is not just the fancy musing of guys who have interesting thoughts about Jesus because they happen to walk and talk with him. No, what they teach has the authoritative stamp of God upon it. It is divinely given teaching. It's inspired. It it bears the weight of God's word. What the apostles teach is what God is teaching. I hope you see that. Which helps us make sense of why this is listed here first. It, It colors and gives light to everything else. It's literally God speaking to this early church on how to be a church. And here's the six million dollar question. Is God speaking like this to us today? And the answer is both yes and no. No, he isn't speaking through inspired apostles today. Since the New Testament is quite clear that the spiritual gift of apostleship has ended. After the original 12 apostles with that added 13th of the Apostle Paul, after they all died, there were no more apostles. The New Testament doesn't pick more apostles, and the early church didn't pick more apostles. And therefore, because there were no more apostles, therefore there was no more God, prophetically speaking, through the apostles. So in that sense, no, God is not speaking to us like that today. But in another sense, yes, he is. In that, the apostles, inspired by the Spirit of Christ, wrote down their teaching for us in what we now have as the New Testament. In other words, if we ask the question, do we have the apostles' teaching today, the answer is yes, we do, right here. And of course, there are numerous places throughout the New Testament where the apostles themselves realize that that what they're writing is in fact inspired scripture. And therefore they, as a unique group of chosen individuals, they're quite literally laying the foundation for the New Testament church in their teaching and in their writing. Paul himself states this in Ephesians 2 verse 20. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, that is the church, built upon, built upon what? What is this church built upon? He says, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, their their teachings and their writings, Christ Jesus himself being our cornerstone. In essence, dear church, here's what I want you to see. The diet of this early church, the steady diet by which the spirit-filled church of God was being fed and nourished was by the word of God. Children, the first question in your children's bulletin asks this. Can I hear God speak to me today? Can I hear God speak to me today? And the answer is, from the Bible, yes. From the Bible, yes. In fact, you could open up this afternoon, and if you read it out loud, it'll be God speaking to you in English. Or perhaps if you start reading in Spanish, it'll be God speaking to you in Spanish. To be sure, when preaching is happening that is grounded in and based out of the Holy Scriptures, when preaching is faithful to the truth of the Scriptures, then, dear church, you are hearing God speak to you there as well. And when God speaks to you, it is not an empty word. It is a life-giving, life-changing, life-enhancing word. No wonder the church has always placed preaching as the preeminent and center to the life of the church. And no wonder after the Reformation, when the gospel was recovered and placed front and center, the the very architecture of medieval churches changed. It used to be that the, the Lord's Supper 
uh, which the medieval Catholic Church saw as an actual sacrifice and put it on what they called an altar, was always the first thing in the center of the church, and the pulpit was off to the side. But once the gospel and the preaching of the gospel was resumed to be central, the pulpit came back as the central place of any given worship in the church. Not only instructs us on what we should be doing as a church, but preaching is the primary means by which we are enabled to grow and continue as a church. Where the Word of God is not regularly preached, where the Word of God is absent from pulpits, dear friends, that is not a Spirit-filled church. It is, properly speaking, not a church at all, no matter what they call themselves on a Sunday morning. And if I could make a, a, a brief case here for expository preaching, that is, preaching which seeks to frame the content and context of any sermon out of the content and context of the biblical text. Expository preaching seeks to communicate faithfully what the Bible is saying, not only in its biblical context, working passage by passage, but also in its historical context. What did the original author intend his writing to mean? That kind of preaching, expository preaching, seeks to be most faithful to the scriptures, to the teachings of the apostles. Uh, you know that there is other kinds of preaching. There are other kinds of preaching out there which attracts many listeners, but is a preaching that doesn't start from the word of God. It doesn't start by saying, what does God's word say and mean, and how can I apply that to God's people today? Uh, this other kind of preaching known more commonly as topical preaching. Topical preaching starts with the question of either, what do I, the preacher, want to talk about, and how can I use or abuse the Bible to make my point? What ends up happening is on a steady diet of topical preaching, you will get a steady diet of the preacher's ideas, my hobby horses, and the things I'm interested in on any given Sunday. Friends, there are many times where we just work through the books of the Bible because we want to hear what the apostles wrote, and it comes to a very awkward text, a text that has some commandment for the women in the church. And I, on a Friday night, am thinking, golly, I have to stand in the pulpit and, and, and talk about this? That's uncomfortable. And yet there it is in the text. With topical preaching, I'd skip it. But with expository preaching, Lord, this is your word for us. Help me preach it faithfully. Topical preaching starts with, what do I want to preach? Or even worse, it might start with the question, what do they want to hear? What does the congregation want to hear? Verses end up being ripped up out of context to make a point. And what's missing is the inspired author's point. Why do I bring this up? Because if the church is to continue devoting herself to the apostles' teaching like we see here, then we will need to do so in such a way that honors what they taught and is faithful to what they wrote down. It is not mere coincidence that, historically speaking, the first mark by which Christians could identify a true church was by seeing if there was true preaching, preaching which is faithful to God's Word. Whenever I go on vacation and I look for a church that my family and I can attend on a Sunday morning, the first thing I'm looking for is, how do they preach? What's the kind of preaching that goes on at this church? Is it expositional? Or if a family is sadly moving away and they're going to start looking for a new church, the first thing I, as their pastor, want them to think about and look for is a church that is committed to expositional preaching. And don't misunderstand me here. Expositional preaching is not about style. It's not about how a preacher preaches. But more importantly, it is about how a preacher decides what to preach. It's an all-consuming submission to the Word. Where the Word goes, the preacher goes. And therefore, there the church goes. Because we want to be a church devoted to the apostles' teaching. Not to Steve's teaching, not to Keith's teaching, not to David's teaching. No, the Word of God is preeminent. Now, the rest of verse 42 is actually just a continuation of this focus on the Word of God. In other words, I think we see all of verse 42 begin with the devotion to the apostles' teaching, which unfolds or is exhibited in these other elements. What Luke says is a devotion to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. 
the late Dr. Harry Reader comments. In verse 42, you've got the Word of God proclaimed, the Word of God shared in love, fellowship, the Word of God displayed in the sacraments, the breaking of bread, and the Word of God returned in intercessory prayer. You'll notice that these are all the main elements. Singing alone is missing. These are all the main elements of a normal church worship service. Preaching the word. Coming together in love and fellowship around the word. The breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper. The word of the gospel displayed in the Lord's Supper to our eyes and taste. And then finally the prayers. The church praying as a result of what they're hearing from the word preached. Friends, don't miss the implication of what we're seeing here. Everything we do here on a Sunday morning, none of this was just created willy-nilly by religious dorks who want to start something called the church. You know, to kind of get people out of their comfort zone and come contribute. I can't stand the pervasive and popularly believed lie that the church and what we do at church was just invented by beer men to control people and then disgustingly to get them for their money. My dear friends, there are really, really good paying jobs <laughs> that are far easier to get to than the church. No, it's all right here. It's what the Holy Spirit led the first Christians to begin doing. And it's what the Holy Spirit has continued to lead God's people to do for the last 2,000 years. We're not here on a Sunday morning just playing church. We don't do church. Church is what the Holy Spirit is doing and has been doing for us and through us for millennia. Well, the first, if the first vital sign of a spirit-filled church is a devotion to the word, that is, it is a word-centered church, then the second mark of a spirit-filled church is that it is a wonder-filled church. It is a wonder-filled church. Notice what Luke writes in verse 43. The result was that awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Very simply, as these men and women continue to learn about Jesus, they in turn grow in their awe of Jesus. That really is the fruit of a spirit-led church. Growing in its knowledge of Jesus, there is something awesome they increasingly perceive in their Savior and King Jesus. As older writers used to put it, there is something awful in their worship. It is full of awe. To be sure, there were also, as Luke tells us, wonders and signs being done through the apostles. We'll go on to read about these as we continue through Acts, but let's not downplay the very real miraculous happenings of the apostles and the apostolic church. Christianity is a supernatural religion. This is not in my notes at all, but this is for us. If we downplay the supernatural nature of Christianity, then we have stepped into a different Christianity altogether. It is supernatural that Jesus was born of a virgin. It is supernatural that Jesus, though killed and buried for three days, rose again on the third day. It was supernatural that the apostles began to speak in different languages that they had not known beforehand. We exist in an enchanted world where sometimes God will break in and do some supernatural miraculous things. So let's not downplay that at all. Here the church is filled with the Holy Spirit and as such the Spirit is working in miraculous ways. Now again, do we need to ask, is this prescriptive or descriptive? I think it's quite descriptive. That is, this was something that was very present with the apostles, these signs and miracles, but not perhaps later with the church. Why? One of the reasons is because God has always verified his inspired word through prophets, which the apostles were. He's, a, and he's accompanied it or, or verified his word by accompanying it with signs and wonders. So remember, this is exactly what Peter said was true of Jesus. Look back up at verse 22. Verse 22, Jesus, uh, Peter says, Jesus of Nazareth, 
a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. In other words, what Peter's saying is that you can know that what Jesus was teaching and saying was true and really from God. Why? Because God worked signs and wonders through him to attest to or, or give verification of and authentic, authentication that he was saying uh, was true, that it was divinely inspired. It's always how God has worked. He links his inspired words with incredible miraculous signs. So because of that, and because we no longer have the apostles with us, who alone were inspired to give us his word, therefore what we see here is, I don't think prescriptive, it's not for all the church, but more descriptive. It's, it's describing this early church. But there is more going on here. We'll see this more in the next two weeks as the scene changes to the apostles going into the temple. Peter has just preached that the last days have arrived. The Spirit has come. The nations are being gathered to Israel. This is, this is promised fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Now traditionally, think about it, the heartbeat of Israel, the very center around which all of Israel focused was on the temple, the place where God dwelled. The Old Testament, and, and Ezekiel especially highlights this, the Old Testament ends with the Spirit up and leaving the temple. By the end of the Old Testament, the Spirit is gone. The building's there. The sacrifices are still happening. The priests are still running around. But the presence of God is gone. But now, the Spirit has returned. And His presence is not back in the Old Temple. No, now it's wherever His people are gathered. Sometimes they'll go to the temple, as we see they do in verse 46, and, and when they're there, it'll be clear that the Spirit is with these Christians and not with the religious leaders in the temple. But the Spirit is also going to be with these Christians in their homes. And as we'll see, He'll be with them when they're persecuted and they scatter and go outside of Israel. The point is this, the Spirit has returned, and He has returned to refill His temple but his temple is no longer made of brick and mortar, but is made up of his very people, all who belong to and believe in Jesus Christ. As Peter himself will later write in his first epistle to the churches, these churches who are scattered across Asia Minor, he says, As you come to him, a living stone, Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a spiritual temple to be a holy priesthood through Jesus Christ. Friends, whether our day is marked by miraculous signs and wonders or not, that is a wonderful truth. The Holy Spirit is with His people, which means the Holy Spirit is here. Filling the space now and filling our hearts and working in us to be a light to the nations. If the world wants to come and meet God, where can they go? Answer, they can go to a good church. God is there. God is here. Ought that not to fill our worship with awe, gratitude, and serious worship? Next week, we'll look more closely at this, this use of the word signs. It only happens here the end of chapter 2 and later in chapter 4, and it has significance, but you'll have to come back and hear that. Regardless, I hope you see the logical flow of what's going on here. The church's diet of the Word produced within the church awe and wonder. Uh, like any good doctor, you go to the doctor, he's going to ask you, what's your diet been like? What have you been eating past few months? Well, a good doctor is also going to ask you, are you getting any exercise? Are you working out? And that's something of what we see here. Not only are they eating properly, feeding themselves on God's Word, but they're also properly exercising, working out what they're seeing in the Word. Do you see that in verse 44 and 45? And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Dear friends, there's the true wonder and awe of this church. They've been so changed by Christ, so sanctified and matured by the Word of God, that now they're working it out by serving one another. 
If I can make a somewhat startling point, verse 44 and 45, them giving up their goods to help one another, that is better and more awesome and more wonderful than miracles and signs. Miracles are cool, but even a demon can counterfeit a good miracle. What's amazing, what's truly wonderful and cannot be counterfeited is a group of people being so changed that they now want to give away their goods to serve the greater good of the church. I almost don't want to get into the question of whether or not the church should be doing this today. Is this prescriptive or descriptive? Because at the end of the day, it's easy for modern evangelicals to affirm the descriptive nature of this text that no, 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 this isn't a biblical case for for communistic living. But then we kind of ignore the fact that the text does provide a general pattern we should be emulating, namely generosity from the heart. These early Christians, they held on to their possessions so lightly with an open hand. Filled by the Spirit, they put the needs of others first. Friends, we shouldn't stumble over this passage and and try and explain it away quickly. First, we should see here something significant in the experience of these early Christians. What does Luke write later in Acts chapter 4, verse 32? Just turn your eye to Acts 4, 32. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. There's a guy in this church who, um, because I have a Honda Civic, you know, I can only fit like two Legos in the back of my car. And every once in a while, I need to get something bigger than two Legos, and so I need a truck, and I ask this friend, hey, can I borrow your truck? And every time, no matter what, he says, it's yours. It's yours. Look what Acts 11, Acts 11, verses 27 through 29 say. In these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Verse 29, so the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Do you see? Their general leaning here is that of giving and of serving and of considering your material wealth not as something to hoard, but to use for the help of other brothers and sisters. In a word, generosity. The wonderful thing, the wonder-filled nature of this early church is that they are generous. You can almost categorize what's going on here this way. In verse 42, they are focusing on loving God by hearing from him and fellowshipping around his word. But now in verse 44 and 45, they're loving each other. Do you see, as they love God, they then grow in loving one another. It's almost as if the two greatest commandments are playing out here. Now, here's the burning question I know many of you are asking. Is this communism? No. It's clear that these believers all shared and were generous voluntarily. That's the key. The great mistake of communism is that it makes the state and state laws a god, a kind of messiah. And therefore, this state god enforces its laws and forces people to give up their personal property, their income, and even their lives. All of it, you, belong to the state. Communism is statism, but that's not what's going on here. In fact, later in Acts 5, Peter will tell Ananias and Sapphira they didn't have to give anything to the church. They were free to give as much or as little as they wanted. In fact, we know that all personal property wasn't given up because throughout Acts we see the churches meeting where? In individual homes. These homes, according to Acts, actually still have owners and we have their names, which means that they still owned these homes as individuals. They weren't given to the church. So let's not fall for the increasingly vogue lie that socialism and communism is not only good, but it's biblically grounded. Point of fact, it's not. All right. So we've seen that a spirit-filled church is a word-centered church. It is a wonder-filled church. And now thirdly, we see that it is a worshiping church. A worshiping church. Verse 46 and 47 
And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. Remember, there are about 3,120 people, and the church seems to be growing. I think we can fit at most comfortably 170 I have an old pamphlet from 1983 that says we can fit 220 people in here. I think that would be very uncomfortable. But imagine 3,120 in one day. What do you do? What do you do on a Sunday morning? Well, here we're told that they both went to the temple and broke bread in their homes, praising God. The idea seems to be that they went together to the only place large enough to receive this growing band of believers to worship God. And it makes sense that they would go to the temple. They were used to the temple being the place where God was worshipped. Perhaps they thought that in these latter days, as God kept pouring out His Spirit, that more and more people would become Christians, and as such, maybe the temple itself would become something of a Christian building. Or perhaps they already knew, as Jesus had indeed already taught them, that the building itself no longer mattered. That they, in union with Jesus, that they were now indeed the true temple. As John Calvin comments on this passage, they go to the temple to both worship God, but in their worship they are also being a witness, showing the other Jews there where the presence of God truly is. Still, we see that they also enjoyed fellowship at individual homes, breaking bread together and showing hospitality to one another, whether this was the continued celebration of the Lord's Supper, but now in smaller groups, I don't know, or maybe this is just ordinary meals enjoyed together. The point is that they were a church worshiping God together. They were living life together. They were, as the text says, together praising God. That's the point. The Spirit-filled church is a praising church. It is a worshiping church that is assembled together, a church that is excited to come together and exalt the name of our Savior. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in one of his 50 sermons on this text, makes this point that if you find yourself not excited to gather with God's people to worship God, it may in fact mean that you are not yet a born-again believer. That when the Holy Spirit draws you to believe in Jesus. One of the first things that the Spirit does in you is that He excites you to be with other believers and to come together to worship Him. And the things that used to be weird and awkward, like singing 200-year-old hymns on a Sunday morning, increasingly become satisfying, joyful, and needed so that as you grow in the faith, The Lord's Day worship becomes something that you cannot miss with your life. Just a note here on singing. It's clear in the New Testament that singing is to be done. It's a command of Christians in Ephesians 5. We see it commanded in Colossians 3. Singing has always been a part of the worship of the people of God. The book of Psalms being our greatest hymnal ever given. And make no mistake, we will continue to worship God in song for eternity. In the new heavens and the new earth, there's no more preaching. There's no more Lord's Supper, but there will be singing. But isn't it significant that we see here in Acts 2 the description of praise and worship and yet no mention of singing? At the very least, I think that this teaches us that worship and praise is more than just singing. It's not less than, but it's certainly more than. Many people comment that they don't like uh, uh, this worship, or they do like that worship, by which they mean the singing. But I think the point being made here is that the worship of the church properly begins with the call to worship. And the worship continues with the church worshiping in prayer. And there's worship in the reading of Scripture. And there's worship in the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread. There's worship in the preaching of the Word. There's worship in singing, yes. But then there's also worship in the, in the final benediction. All of what we do together on a Lord's Day morning is our worship. Children, the second question in your children's bulletin asks this. 
What is the first and main purpose of the church? What is the first and main purpose of the church? Answer, to worship God, to praise God. But that really is the first reason why God has gathered a people to himself. It is preeminently to worship and praise and make much of him. If we get that first purpose wrong, and we think that the first purpose of the church is elsewhere, perhaps evangelism, we will make the mistake of catering our church to that secondary purpose as if it's primary, and perhaps downplay some of those things like awkward worship so as to attract other people. But if we keep the first purpose preeminent, and the second purpose is second, in their right order, God, I think, blesses that and uses that as a means to bring people in. So we move to our last point. A word-centered church, a wonder-filled church, a worshiping church, and lastly, a spirit-filled church is a witnessing church. Look at verse 47 as we come to a close. And having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The church's commitment to Christ, her commitment to hearing the word of Christ is taught by the apostles, by feeding on Christ and the Lord's Supper, on communing with Christ and fellowship with one another, and in prayer, in essence, in her all-filled worship of Christ, all of that had a pleasant aroma with those in the surrounding community. Because they were keeping first things first and most attracted and focused upon God, other people saw that and said, that's different. I like that. They had favor with all the people. And because of that, what do we see? The Lord added to their number day by day. He was using the church to be a witness. And they were being a witness. They were sharing Christ. They were exuding Christ in their lives and how they treated one another and how they treated their neighbors. And by the grace of God, that had an attractive pull. Others around wanted to know the same Jesus and come to follow him, and they did. Now, listen, that effect, that response of unbelieving neighbors wanting to become believing church members, which happens even today, that does not always happen. That result is determined by God and God alone. Nothing more, nothing less. We can't turn this into a kind of equation, a plug and play. If we do this, then the people will come. If you build it, no. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's the effect that a spirit-filled, healthy church will have just, just the opposite. Later in Acts, we'll see surrounding communities hate the church and kick out Christians from their community and neighborhood. And nothing changed in the church. They were still being just as faithful still preaching the same gospel. So what does that mean? I think it means this. It means we pray. We pray that God would be pleased to use us in such a way that our witness is received favorably by the surrounding community. We don't change what we do. We don't play down our distinctives. Our worship is a heavenly worship, which means it's alien and weird. And it's okay. And it's good. We also recognize sometimes the community will respond with animosity. They just won't get it. They won't necessarily like us. But we sure do pray, don't we? And we ask God to do what we can't do. Change their hearts so that they respond favorably. God can do that. He can change their hearts. That's the point of verse 47, isn't it? It's God who adds to the church day by day those who are being saved. Children, the last question in your bulletin asks this. What is the second purpose for why the church exists? What is the second purpose for why the church exists? Answer, to be a witness for God. To be a witness to the world about God, specifically about Jesus Christ. And seriously, a major part of that witness is simply gathering together to pray. To ask God to do what honestly, again, we ourselves cannot do 
If you take anything away this morning, take this. We are not cool enough to change the culture to make them to want to become Christians. There it is. But God is powerful enough. God is powerful enough to use this funny little gathering to do the impossible. I wonder if you would pray for that. I'll see you this evening at 5 p.m. as we gather to pray for the city of Greenbelt. Let's pray.